Sometimes I wonder what it would be like if somebody just wandered in here on a Sunday evening and you didn't know anything about the Bible. Nothing. And here I am, I'm trying to explain this evening's message for you. Because what we're doing is we're going verse by verse through the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And so we're kind of building on the story as it's gone before. A, a little bit like a television series. You know, you, you see what's happened in the past and it builds to the future. And we really don't have a video that kind of says, you know, uh, last week on the life of Joseph or something like that. So let me just tell you, the life of Joseph is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. And it deals with a man who came from a wealthy family with a lot of kids. He had 11 brothers and one sister. But the family was really messed up. It was so messed up that Joseph's brothers hated him. Not completely without a cause. And they hated him so much that one day they planned to kill him. But they changed their minds and said, no, we won't kill him. We'll just sell him as a slave for the rest of his life. And that's what they did. He ended up in Egypt, and he served in a man named Potiphar. He served in his house for many years. But then, convicted of a crime he never committed. He was completely innocent. He was thrown into prison. And while he was in prison, he met two men, a butler and a baker, who worked for Pharaoh, and he interpreted their dreams. Well, later, two years after they were released from prison, the butler and the baker... The butler reported the fact that Joseph could interpret dreams. And last week we saw that Joseph interpreted two dreams that Pharaoh had. Pharaoh had a dream about seven fat cows that came up from the Nile River. And then seven skinny cows came up from the Nile River after them. And the skinny cows ate the fat cows. It's a crazy dream. The skinny cows ate the fat cows, but they weren't any fatter afterwards. And then it was a similar dream. Pharaoh woke up, went back to sleep. He dreamed again, and he had a dream about seven heads of grain that were plump and fat and great-looking heads of grain. They were devoured by seven skinny, bad-looking heads of grain. He didn't know what the dream meant. And none of the holy men, none of the magicians, none of the, uh, the, the priests of Egypt could tell him what it meant. But Joseph, and we saw this last week, Joseph said, Pharaoh, I'll tell you what this dream means. Those two dreams, they're really one dream. God told you the same thing, and he told it to you twice. This is what's going to happen, Pharaoh. There is going to be an unbelievable seven-year period of prosperity in Egypt. The crops are going to grow like crazy. It'll be seven years of abundance. But following the seven years of abundance, there's going to come seven years of famine. And the famine is going to be so bad that everybody's going to forget about the seven years of plenty. Now, that was the message that God spoke to Pharaoh through the dream, brought the interpretation of it by Joseph. But now, starting at verse 33 of Genesis chapter 41, now Joseph is going to explain what to do. I mean, after all, don't you think it's possible that Joseph could have said, Yeah, okay, uh, Pharaoh, this is how it goes. Um, Seven big years, big harvest, big grain coming in, then seven years of famine. Nice to meet you. I'll go back to the prison now. Theoretically, he could have done that. But no, now Joseph is going to add something onto this. Notice this starting at verse 33. He says, now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. This is what I want you to understand. In this section, Joseph goes from knowledge to wisdom. What do I mean? Well, knowledge is you're going to have seven big years and then seven famine years. Seven years of great harvest and seven years of terrible harvest. That's knowledge. He's just telling him this is what's going to happen in the future. But friends, don't you understand that there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge will tell you what's going to happen. 
Wisdom tells you how to prepare for it. Wisdom tells you what to do. And Joseph said, this is the first thing you need to do, Pharaoh. Look at what he says there in verse 33. Let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. First thing you better do, you got to put a man in charge of this. This is a huge administrative project. A lot has to be done. You better find a man who can lead this. Now, again, I want to restate the point that I think is so important. Joseph was now beginning to apply wisdom to his knowledge. And we need to understand that we live in a world today that has a lot more knowledge than it does wisdom. You know, look, you can find a lot of knowledge on the internet. I don't think you're going to find all that much wisdom. You, you can find a lot of knowledge, and our scientists, our poets, our politicians, and the rest can often see what the problem is. But listen, real knowledge is to know not just what the problem is, but wisdom goes beyond it and says Jesus is the answer. And that's what Joseph was delivering to Pharaoh. Not just telling him what the problem was going to be, but also bringing a more important message. Pharaoh, this is what you need to do about this. Friends, I just got to say, this is heavy on my heart. Because if there's anything that's true in the body of Christ today, and I'm speaking generally, I'm not trying to single out our congregation. Matter of fact, I, I would think that our congregation is better than most when it comes to this. Although, look, that's kind of how a pastor feels about his congregation. You know, don't most parents think that their kids are above average? Those average kids are out there somewhere, just I don't know where. So, and most pastors feel, man, my congregation, because you love them. We love them. We say, okay, yes, but listen, it's my concern that we not only be hearers of the word, but also doers. It's my earnest desire that we not be a sermon appreciation society. That that's the reason why we gather together. To hear and to appreciate. That was a fine sermon. That was a great sermon. Yeah, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, that was a fine sermon. No, no, no. We don't want to be merely a sermon appreciation society. We don't want to be those who only hear the word. We must go on to do it. And Joseph gives us a tremendous example of this. Matter of fact, look at what he told them to do. Look at verse 34 with me. It says, let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. You see, in his God-given wisdom, Joseph saw that this needed proper administration. There was an organized plan that had to be guided and executed and conceived. There had to be goals and visions and benchmarks. There had to be accountability. There had to be a whole system where this job could actually get done. I mean, first of all, you got to understand the problem. What's the magnitude of the problem? What's the population of Egypt? How much grain are we going to have to get a set aside for the seven bad years? How is it going to be administrated? Then you've got to make goals and a vision to meet those goals. Okay, what's the goal? The goal is to have enough grain at the end of the seven famine years so that everybody can eat. Well, then let's figure out how much are we going to need? How much do we need to collect? Somebody has to make those calculations. And then the right people need to be put in place. Oh, what good would it do to say, well, here's the plan, but you don't have the people to do it. You don't have the people who are going to actually follow through. And then you got to have somebody who makes sure it's all operating according to plan. you got to make sure that it's being held accountable. And then the work has to be measured at the end of it. How much grain do we actually have in those silos? Now listen, I want you to notice this. God was going to use a man to put all of that into place. He wasn't going to do it just by a miracle. But, I mean, Joseph didn't say this. Uh, Pharaoh, listen, we're going to have seven good years and seven famine years. Let's just pray that God miraculously creates grain in the silos of Egypt. Let's just pray that God sends manna down from heaven. No, no, no. Joseph wasn't thinking like that. Joseph said, look, this is a big problem, but it's workable. Let's plan. Let's do it. Let's execute this. That's why God's sending the seven years of plenty so that we can plan ahead for this. It wasn't going to happen by what we normally think of as a miracle, but it was definitely going to happen by the Spirit of God as we see later on. So the whole plan was put in place, and Joseph is conceiving this. 
By the way, do you see Joseph already did the quick calculation of how much it would take? Joseph was a smart guy. Do you see what he says in verse 34? Let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt. Joseph is so clever with this kind of stuff that he's doing the calculation. Yeah, how much? Well, probably about a fifth, probably about 20%. That's how much we'd have to collect from everybody. How about that? How would you like to have your tax return? The government just says, okay, just give us 20%. That's it. I know a lot of people would say, thank you, Jesus, for 20% taxes. You're saying, man, I mean, just, just my social security is almost that. And you go on and on and on. But let me let's just say this. That's one way to look at it. The tax rate was 20%. Here's another way to look at it. We don't know for sure, but there seem to be indications that the normal rate of taxation, because they had taxes all the time in Egypt, the normal rate of taxation was 10%. So you could look at it as being only 20%, or you could look at it as the taxes being doubled in one year. But that's what they did. They doubled the taxes, they made it up to 20%, and they said, let's collect this particular grain. Why? Look at verse 36 with me, please. That the land may not perish during the famine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it was so important. People would live or die based on what Joseph, or what happened with Pharaoh's wisdom here. This wasn't messing around. And I understand there's some things that you or I could do, and if we don't plan for it, if we don't prepare, what's the big deal? Okay, I'm going to go out fishing. Well, I forgot to take the right bait. Oh, well, I don't catch any fish that day. Okay, it's no big deal, whatever. I'll just, I'll just deal with it. Some things we don't prepare for, we're not organized, we don't administrate. What's the big deal? But there's other things. If you get it wrong, it is life or death in the balance. And that's what Joseph was trying to say. We're not kidding around with this. This is a big deal. People are going to live or die based on how we follow through, based on the knowledge that God gave us. Now we need to apply wisdom. And if we don't apply wisdom, the consequences are going to be severe. Now, Joseph said all this, and I just want to call your attention to one other thing that Joseph said. He said it back in verse 33, and I'm going to make a little guess here. Joseph said in verse 33, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. I'm going to assume something, and I'm just assuming it. If you think I'm wrong, come up to me after service and say, I think you were wrong, and I'll say, well, I think I was right. And you can say, well, I think you were wrong. But I don't think Joseph had himself in mind. When he's standing before Pharaoh, and he says in verse 33, let Pharaoh select a wise and discerning man, he's not going like this, let Pharaoh select a wise and discerning man. He's not doing that. Joseph says, look, I just know the job needs to be done. I'm the kind of guy who can't look at a problem without thinking of a way to solve it. I'm just telling you, Pharaoh, this is what needs to be done. You need the right man to head this. So I think that what Pharaoh says in verse 37 surprises Joseph more than anyone. Look at what he says. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? And look, this is remarkable in verse 37. Not only was the advice good in the eyes of Pharaoh, but in the eyes of all his servants. Listen, the servants would be the first guy to say, oh, this guy, Joseph, uh, what does he know? You know, uh, he's just a slave, just got out of prison. You know, because they might be perceived as being in competition. But there was something so wise, so filled with character, so winsome about Joseph that his answer, his advice even seemed good to the people who might normally be regarded as his competitors, the other servants of Pharaoh. And so what does Pharaoh say? I love that phrase in verse 38. Don't miss it. He called Joseph a man in whom is the spirit of God. Let me tell you, this was ancient Egypt. They had plenty of priests, they had plenty of magicians, they had plenty of advisors, they had plenty of holy men, but you know what they didn't have? They did not have a man in whom was dwelling the Spirit of God. But now they had it in Joseph. Now they had that man. And Pharaoh looks at him and goes, you, you have the Spirit of God. I can tell, everybody can tell. Now there's a few points to draw from that. First of all, wouldn't it be wonderful for somebody to look at my life and say that? I mean, that's how we, we should be as believers. Somebody should be able to look at our life and say, listen, their character, their knowledge, their wisdom, the way they live their life, 
the Spirit of God is with that person. There's something different about them. That's how it should be for me. I trust it should be that way for all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. That's just how it should be. That should be normal for us. But number two, I want you to notice this. This is the first time in the Bible, if we go from Genesis you know, through to Revelation, it's the first time in the Bible where an individual is said to be filled with the Spirit of God. The first time. And you know what's interesting about it? It didn't happen when Joseph was preaching a sermon. It didn't happen when Joseph was singing a song. It didn't happen when Joseph was leading a prayer meeting. It happened when Joseph was applying very practical wisdom and problem solving when he was functioning as an administrator or organizer for Egypt itself. This is what you understand, is that we miss it so big if we think that the Holy Spirit's only interest or even his main interest is in preaching or singing or prayer meetings. Now listen, I believe the Holy Spirit has an interest in all those things. I certainly hope so. I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit as I do what I'm doing right now. But when you go to school, the Holy Spirit has an interest in that. When you go to your job, the Holy Spirit has an interest in that. When you go back to your family, the Holy Spirit has an interest in that. Do, do you see what this is saying? Isn't this significant? The first mention of an individual being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's for a man to do a very practical job. And other people noticed it. Invite the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit into everything you do. What do you got to lose? Lord, I want to be a spirit-led student. I want to be a spirit-led businessman. I want to be a spirit-led, you know, financial person. I want to be a spirit-led mother or father. See what I'm saying? That's how it worked very simply for Joseph in this particular situation. Now, going on to verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Okay, this is the first time, starting in verse 39, that Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, Mister, you're promoted. You're the guy. You told me I needed a guy to lead all this. You're the guy. You're the one who's going to rule over Egypt, over every regard except for the throne, and you're going to run the whole show. I bet there was nobody more surprised than Joseph. Can you just remember something about Joseph right now in this scene in Genesis chapter 41? An hour before Pharaoh spoke those words, Joseph was in the dungeon. In an hour's time, and look, let's face it, I don't literally know that it was 60 minutes, but let's just say. In an hour's time, he was brought from a dungeon, out of the dungeon, given a bath and a shave, put nice clothes on, and spoke to Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream, and then told him what wisdom would require in regard to the dream. He told him all that, and now he's being said, okay, great, I'll make you second in all the kingdom of Egypt. That's a pretty quick promotion, don't you think? Isn't that going from the pit to the pinnacle really, really fast? Isn't that, as Brother Mike shared with us from St. Patrick, isn't that going from being a stone in the mud to being placed on the top of the wall just like that? That's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, in a moment, in an hour's time, Joseph went from prisoner in a dungeon to prime minister of Egypt. It was remarkable. And I tell you, no one was more surprised about it than Joseph himself. Now, let, let me just make an addition to that, and I think it's interesting to talk about this, is that God gave him such a promotion that Pharaoh said, you're going to be over everything. Look at it in verse 41. He says, you shall be over my house. You see, Joseph had the knowledge and the wisdom, but Pharaoh had a choice. What do I mean by that? Joseph delivers the message faithfully. Joseph gives wisdom to Pharaoh as a good messenger of wisdom. But Pharaoh had the choice. Pharaoh could have very easily said, 
hey, thanks for the advice, Joseph, but uh, we got this. We're good. I got a whole team. I got a whole government. I got a secretary of agriculture that I'll get to work right on this. Pharaoh could have done that. He could just said, thanks, Joseph. Great word, but listen, um, we're fine. We're fine. Don't need any help. No, Pharaoh had a choice, and Pharaoh's choice was, am I going to submit everything to the messenger of God, or am I not? Am I going to keep things in my own control, or am I going to say, this man truly is God's messenger. I am going to listen to him. But Pharaoh very wisely, he surrendered to Joseph's knowledge. He surrendered to Joseph's wisdom, and now he's surrendering to Joseph's authority. Because Joseph was going to be over Pharaoh's house, over all his personal business. Joseph was going to rule over all the people of Egypt. It was going to be run according to his word. Joseph was going to be second in the kingdom behind Pharaoh himself. And Joseph was going to have authority over all the land of Egypt. That's quite a promotion, don't you think? Now, I wonder if somebody would look at Joseph's life and think, Man, overnight success. One of Pharaoh's servants standing right by. He goes, are you kidding me? This guy was in a dungeon an hour ago, and now he's the prime minister of Egypt? Talk about an overnight success. But you and I know, don't we? You and I know that Joseph had at least 13 years of hard preparation for this very moment. 13 years where God poured into him and through much adversity and through much hard work and through much diligence, God developed in him the kind of character that could be the man to be trusted for just this kind of opportunity. Joseph looked like an overnight success, but only to people who didn't know what was going on. And listen, one of the reasons I say that is because sometimes we look at other people that we think are overnight successes. Oh man, it all seemed to come pretty easy to them. Let me just caution you, brother or sister, you don't really know, do you? You don't really know. You never know. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible that it all came to them easily, but you don't know until you really get into their life and find out. It would have been very easy for somebody to look at Joseph and just say, well, it all came easy to him. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not easy. God built it into him and built it into him very, very deeply. Now, I just want to take a few minutes out here. Uh, that didn't sound like I'm ending, does it? Because I'm not ending yet. I don't want to give anybody false hope. I do want to take a few minutes out and, and give you three ideas about promotion and advancement. Now, I use both of those words because some of you, you you're, your own business, you work for yourself. And so you don't really don't think in terms of promotion and the company or whatever, but you think in terms of advancement. And I just want to give you three principles that I think are very important to think about, promotion and advancement, that are just sort of suggested to my mind about this whole Joseph story. Number one, promotion and advancement are from the Lord. What do I mean by that? Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7 say this. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. Ladies and gentlemen, every successful person, everyone who is exalted in some way or another should humbly look to God with gratitude. So you're doing pretty good? You're a success? You're achieving something in this world? Praise the Lord, I'm happy for you. I want us all to be big, wild successes in this world. That would be great, but listen... Don't get proud. Don't get arrogant. You realize that promotion and advancement is from the Lord. Be grateful to God for that. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what do you mean it's from the Lord? I worked pretty hard for this. What do you mean it's from the Lord? I, I went to college, and I got really smart so that I could do this. Well, what do you mean it's from the Lord? I've been so diligent to do what i got to do in business. Oh, brother, sister, listen to me, please. Who gave you the heart and the ability to work hard? Who, who gave you those brain cells that seem to work so good? Who gave you the opportunities? Did they not in some way or another come to you from the hand of God? I'm not trying to say that you should expect to succeed without working hard or without doing your work or without educating yourself. No, no, no. But even those things are the gift of God to us we should receive them with humility and say, Lord, thank you. My heart is filled with gratitude to you for whatever success I have. That's number one. Number two principle, 
Promotion and advancement are never enough without the Lord. Never. Don't we see this in people who have achieved some great level of success? Man, they're up there, and in the world's eyes, they're heroes. In the world's eyes, they have it all. And you know what? A lot of them come here to Santa Barbara. And they say, look, I got it all, don't I? But there's something inside of them that says, I do not have it all. I need something more. Now, a lot of times those people channel that into a very good impulse. They say, I need something more. It can't be all about me. I got to do good for other people. And so they establish charitable foundations. They give a lot of money to good causes. And let me say, God bless them for that. That's a good thing that they do. And we need more people to have that kind of attitude. Those are good things. But let me tell you, it's really only a beginning. Because it's true that we should try to do good for other people with good things that have come to us. But listen, it's ultimately only fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But I tell you, ask anybody who has achieved great levels of success. You just ask them. And they'll tell you it's not enough. And even if they don't know that it's not enough without Jesus, that's what's missing in their life. Go ahead. Next time you're at, uh, shopping at the supermarket in Montecito and you bump into, you know, Oprah on the produce aisle, you just ask her. You know, it's successful people. It's true. They will understand that, look, even for as much as I might achieve, it's not enough. Success without Jesus is never enough. But then number three, and in my mind, this is the sweetest one of all. Jesus received the ultimate promotion or advancement. Joseph's path from a humble servant and prisoner to a powerful ruler becomes a prophecy of Jesus himself. Let me read to you from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, because it describes this ultimate promotion. Ready? I love reading this passage. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Talk about a promotion. Jesus came as a humble servant among us. Jesus came as a man born to an obscure family in an obscure part of the world. And for most of his life, he lived in humble obscurity. He went from that dungeon of obscurity to the greatest position ever. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's promotion, friends. Now again, it was in God's plan. It happened all according to God's plan as it worked out. But please don't forget the fact that Jesus is the ultimate promoted one. All right, now let's take a look at the last few verses we're going to look at together here this evening. Verses 42 through 44 where we see the signs of Joseph's promotion. If you get a promotion, you should have something to show for it, right? So here's the signs of Joseph's promotion. Verse 42. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. You see what Pharaoh did? Joseph, you're promoted. You're ahead over everything. And do you see this signet ring that I have? My, and you know what a signet ring is? It's like a ring with a special seal on it. They would use that seal on official documents. It was a symbol of Pharaoh's authority. He takes that symbol of his authority and he gives it to Joseph. Here you go. You take it. You have the authority now. Where in just a few Hours before, Joseph 
you know what his jewelry was? Manacles around his wrists. That's the jewelry he was sporting. Now what does he have? He has a signet ring that indicates that he has all authority. That's the first thing he gave him. The second thing he gave him was clothes. Verse 42, he clothed him in garments of fine linen. Once Joseph had the rags of a dungeon. Now he has wonderful apparel. He has the garments of fine linen. Oh, oh, they dressed him up nice when he came out of prison, but that wasn't good enough. Put garments of fine linen, the best suit, the best apparel. I want that man in the best apparel possible. He gave him authority. He gave him apparel. But then notice what next he gave him. It's contained in verse 42. He put a gold chain around his neck. Once Joseph had a chain, yeah, it was a chain that went on the shackles that he wore with his hands. Now get that away. Put that gold chain around his neck. Go ahead, a nice big thick one too. Put the gold chain. There he is. He's the man. He's in charge. Adorn him with beautiful adornment. And then the final thing that he gave him, he gave him affluence. Verse 43, he had him ride in the second chariot. Joseph, everywhere you go now, it's going to be by limo. Everywhere. You, you need to go to the gas station by limo. That's it. Everywhere you go, it's going to be by that. He lifted him up to a high place, a place of affluence. Now, as I end this, I want to make two points. The two points are this. We love to see ourselves in the story of the Bible, don't we? And we always know who we are in the story of Joseph, right? Who are we? We're Joseph. And you know what? There's a lot for us to see here with us being Joseph. I'm not going to shy away from that. Because I'll tell you this. What Pharaoh did for Joseph is a picture of what God does for us. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the four things that God does for us, illustrated by Joseph here. The first thing he does for his children is he gives us authority. The believer has authority. What do I mean? He gave us the permission to pray in Jesus' name. That's authority. The believer has authority. God says, I'll give you my authority, my signet ring, so to speak. The second thing he does, the way that Joseph illustrates a child of God, is he gives him apparel. What do I mean? We're clothed in the righteousness of God. Get rid of that itchy fig leaf that you've been using to cover your own sin. Man, you have got a robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ himself gives you. He clothes you in the finest apparel. The third thing he gives you is adornment. God says, you are my child and I want you looking good. I'm going to give you gifts of grace. I'm going to give you my love. I'm going to give you the fruit of the spirit. I'm going to adorn you with so much. And then the final thing God gives us as his children, he gives us affluence. Now, I'm not talking about the affluence of a fat wallet necessarily. I'm talking about spiritual affluence. You and I are kings and priests before God. We rule and reign with Jesus. We have a glorious present and an even better destiny in Jesus Christ. He gives us a place of spiritual affluence. And friends, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in him as your Savior and as your Lord, this belongs to you. You can say, Lord, here it is. I, I want to walk in that authority. I want to walk in that adornment. I want to walk in that apparel. I want to walk in that affluence, Lord. Spiritually speaking, all those things belong to me. That's what we get from it as we see ourselves in Joseph. But can I give you a better way to see yourself in this? I think a way that's even more true. Joseph is a picture of Jesus Christ in who he is and what he's done and in the place that he should have in our life. And you and I, we are like Pharaoh. What do I mean? The ultimate messenger from God, Jesus Christ, has come to us. Jesus is a messenger from God and Jesus speaks the truth about the future. Did not Joseph speak the truth about the future? Seven good years, seven bad years, it's gonna happen. This is the truth, Pharaoh. Jesus speaks to us the truth about the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know all your future. I'm not here to tell you what's going to happen in the next, you know, five hours or in the next five days. But I can tell you this about the future of everyone in this room. Everyone in this room is going to have to stand before God and give an account. We don't like to think about that, do we? But you're going to have to. If you reject Jesus Christ... If you push away the Son of God and all that he's done for you, what are you going to say for yourself? What, you never heard? Sorry, you heard it right now. What, what are you going to say for yourself? You, you thought a better offer would come along? What are you talking about? This is Jesus. 
We can talk about, well, I, you know, what about that whole thing? Did Adam have a belly button? I have so many questions. Forget about all that and put your focus on Jesus Christ. You, every one of us, are going to be held to account for what we did with Jesus Christ. Jesus tells you your future in that sense, but Jesus in his plan has provided for the bread of life. You know, God has administrated a beautiful plan to bring rescue and salvation to the world, and he just invites you to accept it. But now you and I are in the place of Pharaoh, and we've heard the wisdom of God, we've had the guidance, we can accept it or reject it, we know something about the future, we have God's wisdom right in front of us. God's wisdom for us is put our faith in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did for us on the cross. Here's our opportunity right here, right now. Now you're like Pharaoh. What are you going to do? If you look at Jesus and say, you know what, I'm good. Thanks for the advice. Man, I know you mean well, but I can handle this on my own. You're in a bad place then. You need to put aside that self-reliance and you need to do what Pharaoh did. You need to give Jesus ownership over everything in your life and let him Roll out the great plan, the great purpose that he has for you in his plan. Father, this is our prayer. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you would give grace and wisdom to every one of us. Lord, I I pray for those uh, who just sort of all over again, Lord, they need to put promotion and advancement of their own life into perspective before you. Lord, make us all filled with greater gratitude towards you for whatever we're able to do unto you. But Lord, I pray that you would move among us and speak, Lord. Call if there's anybody here who needs to make a commitment of faith to Jesus tonight. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in the name of your precious son. And I didn't say amen because I'm not done talking yet. Um, I'm not done talking because I want to speak very pointedly to anyone here you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ in some way or another you are living a life of conscious rejection of Jesus you need to let that end right now you need to repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus and I'm just going to give you a very simple opportunity Joseph's going to lead us in a song and as he leads in this song if you know this is me and I need to put my faith in Jesus I need to profess my faith in Jesus All I'm asking you to do is stand up from your seat, go to an aisle, and walk down right here. Just as Joseph in one moment seemed to go from the prison to the pinnacle, so you in one moment, as you put your faith in Jesus Christ, in one moment you can go from darkness to light. You can go from guilty to innocent. You can go from bound by your sin to free in Jesus Christ. You can go from lost to found in one moment. You have to do something about it. You can't just say, well, look, I'm good. I'm good. Great advice, but I'm good. you got to do something about it because lives are on the line and it's your life. So as Joseph plays his song, whoever you are, you come forward. I just want you to come stand up here and I'll lead you in a prayer if you want to profess your faith in Jesus Christ.